Well, welcome to episode 373 of 10 Minute Record Reviews. And this time, I'm going to review a record by Keith Jarrett and his American quartet, The Survivor's Suite, which came out in 1977, recorded 1976 on ECM. This is an American first pressing of that record. It's listening music. It's definitely not cocktail party, background, dinner party music. It's somewhere on the outer boundaries of jazz, where jazz meets classical, meets other genres, meets world music. The quartet on here, of course, features four of the finest musicians to be playing jazz actively in the 1970s. This record is also sometimes called their finest hour. But paradoxically, it also, I think, kind of exemplifies where jazz had gotten to by the late 1970s, away from its mainstream audience, and towards a much more self-defined, self-referential, and kind of niche market. I previously talked about Keith Jarrett on this channel when I reviewed his famous record, The Colon Concert. And in that review, I talked about his background, his flirtations with classical music, his first steps in jazz, and his development of a more experimental musical identity and trajectory as the 60s came to a close. From the early 1970s on, Jarrett is either leading his own small combos or he's a soloist. Now, in terms of his solo work, he does all those tremendous solo concerts on ECM. Those are absolute marvels of sustained improvisation. There's really nobody else quite like him. Of course, that's not the only stuff that Jarrett does in the 1970s. He records in a whole bunch of different configurations, but it's his quartet work, and in particular, his American quartet, which concerns us here. There was, of course, a European quartet, but that's a topic for another video. Jarrett's American Quartet featured Charlie Hayden on bass, the drummer Paul Motion, with whom Jarrett and Hayden had priors in a trio format in the late 60s, and the tenor saxophonist Dewey Redman. And together, that quartet made about a dozen records through the 1970s. The first of those records is actually formally from the end of the Hayden, Motion, Jarrett trio era, and that's Expectations, which comes out on Columbia in 1972. And on that record, Dewey Redman was basically a guest star. That record apparently disappointed the Suits of Columbia, who dropped Jarrett from the label shortly after its release. But what appeared to be a setback soon turns into an opportunity. Jarrett was being managed by George Avakian, the former Persian rug tycoon, formerly also of Columbia Records and Pacific Jazz Records. And after Jarrett was dropped by Columbia, Avakian manages to secure him a very unusual arrangement where he signed simultaneously for Impulse Records and also for the German label ECM. And if Impulse was the gritty, whole wheat, organic, extra spice version of an avant-garde label, then ECM was kind of the hermetically sealed wet wipes version. It had been recording somewhat more avant-garde and some third stream music for several years. Jarrett had already recorded for them, as had people like Paul Blay and Chick Corea. This dual deal with Impulse and with ECM all hinged on a clause which Steve Backer at Impulse negotiated with Avakian. Recognizing that Jarrett was already making a record for ECM at the time, more classically oriented music, which he had composed while supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship, that's the record which comes out as In the Light. The contract drew a distinction between the music he was making for ECM, which was termed literally serious music, and the music that he would make for Impulse. Now, the characteristics of the music he was going to make for Impulse never spelled out in the contract, but we can infer, I guess, that it was considered less serious music, which is hilarious in its own right, but it's also kind of funny because the music which he would end up making for Impulse with Hayden, Motion, and Redmond with his American Quartet was anything but trivial. And compositionally, the music which they end up making for Impulse, this quartet, is not that dissimilar to other Impulse music of the same era, such as made by Pharaoh Sanders, specifically in the multi-instrumental capabilities of the band, their tendency to make very long, sometimes side-length tracks, but probably mostly in the way that the compositions tended to blend in varying styles and varying moods throughout the course of a track. On ECM, Jarrett continued to release his solo piano performances and his more third stream and classical compositions and performances. He also debuted his European quartet on ECM. But the American quartet did make two records for ECM after the Impulse contract lapsed. One of them was recorded in 1976, not released until 1979. It's a live record called Eyes of the Heart, and the other record, also recorded in 1976, is this one. This record is made in April 1976 at Tone Studio Bauer in Ludwigsburg, Germany, with Manfred Eigner as the producer. 
the engineer at the Bauer Studio, which has a lot in common, strangely enough, with the Van Gilder Studio in New Jersey, was the founder and owner, Rolf Bauer, who started it in 1948 by, you guessed it, recording musicians in his living room. And from the very beginning, Bauer was committed to technological advancements. So he's amongst the very first to use true stereo in Europe. He's amongst the very first to use multi-track recording in the 1960s. He's amongst the very first to adopt digital recording in the 1980s. The music of the Survivor's Suite, which is really one piece divided into two, just based on the realities of a vinyl record, was written specifically for a concert that Jarrett and his quartet were going to play at Avery Fisher Hall in New York. What Jarrett knew about Avery Fisher Hall was that the acoustics were not great, and if they played their usual style with a fast tempo and lots and lots of notes, the notes were all going to run together and the sound would be muddied and the audience would enjoy it, or probably equally as importantly the musicians were not going to enjoy it. So he ends up composing music where the tempos are slower, not all the time, but generally slower than was typical of the other work of the quartet. Jarrett plays all kinds of instruments here. He plays the piano, he plays the soprano sax, for an extended part in side two. Charlie Hayden's on bass, Paul Motion's on drums, and Dewey Redman is on the tenor sax, but he's also on percussion as well. The record itself, like many records, divided into two halves. Side one is beginning, side two is the conclusion, and I don't think it's going to be that fruitful for me to give a blow by blow. There's all kinds of different moments and different features of the music on here. I would simply say, well, A, of course, that these are two extended parts of one whole. I would also say that it's a composition that takes you many, many different places, some of which are fantastic, others of which sometimes I struggled with, you might struggle with, or you may just enjoy all of it. Jarrett's own entry on piano takes some eight or nine minutes to actually happen. The music switches between these four legs of a stool, I guess. There's freeish jazz, there's more straight ahead jazz, there's third stream or classical sounding music, and then something approximating world music. I say approximating because it's not really from some defined culture. It's more kind of, you know, the exotica, high-end exotica of Keith Jarrett's head. Side one's pretty absorbing. Side two, I will say, has a testing first five or so minutes, which is pretty much flat out free jazz where Dewey is just going to town on his tenor sax. I will confess that I found that kind of hard work got more bearable for me when Dewey laid off and then Keith and Paul come in. There's a great solo from Keith. But you also are increasingly getting his humming, moaning, grunting, these really unavoidable kinds of sounds. It's not like Glenn Gould where you're saying, oh, is he humming? It's really, really quite present on here. By the 1970s, that's kind of a feature that Jarrett's playing. It's more present here than on some records, like on some of the solo records. And uh, I actually find it a little bit much, I will say. But having said that, I don't want to dwell on negatives. There is some great music here. There's some really swinging music on side two. And it wraps up with Keith, interestingly, on soprano sax, ushering in the outro. As you may have already surmised, I have a somewhat contrary opinion regarding a record which often is given five stars. And I'm going to choose my words carefully, as I usually do, when I'm reviewing something which is not entirely to my taste, but which I know has a very solid and well-informed fan base. If you're into Keith Jarrett, and if you're into his American Quartet, which is a different beast, for instance, from his European Quartet, or his solo records, or his standards records, or his 60s work, then this is probably a record you can't miss. And this is, I think, the constituency that tends to give this record five out of five. And I would say, too, that because he's using slower tempos here, it's probably as good a gateway into the rest of the music of the American Quartet as any. My own feelings are much more mixed. I appreciate the musicianship. I appreciate the sheer ambition of the composition. But do I enjoy it? Not as much as other people, I don't think. Now, I'm not averse to sidelong epics with lots of free jazz sections and so on. I'm a big Pharaoh Sanders fan. But when I compare Jarrett's work to Sanders' work, what I find is I can deal with Farrell's wildness and the out there stuff and the kind of more aversive parts of the music because there's always a payoff and the warmth and the humanity and the trippy grooves that Farrell gets into. Whereas I find that Jarrett, and I know this is sacrilegious, for me, never really warms up enough or swings enough to make the out stuff that he and his group produce entirely worth the whole voyage. So my own experience of this record, and this is after a lot of listening to it, is about a three out of five. Probably because I am just not one of those people that really digs this quartet's approach. And if you do, 
feel free to add another star and a half. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.